So let's think about how to interpret mineral assemblages and look at some typical metamorphic rocks and minerals. So here, for example, is a sketch of a theoretical contact oriel. This comes from John Winter's textbook on igneous and metamorphic petrology. You have a heat source and you have various rocks that abut the intrusion. And depending on what the bulk composition of the rock is, is it a shale, is it a limestone, is it a sandstone, you'll get different kinds of rocks that form in here. If it's a limestone, then when it metamorphoses, it forms marbles. If it's a shale or a sandy shale, then it can form these rocks that we call metapelites. Pelite is an old term for mudstone, so metamorphosed mudstone. And they have characteristic mineral assemblages associated with them. A sandstone, when it's metamorphosed, forms a quartzite. And it is this distribution of minerals, muscovite chlorite, biotite andalusite, cordierite, sillimanite, and so on, that tells us something about the heat distribution around these intrusions. Here, for example, is the Crestmore Quarry, which was in Riverside, California. As I understand it, it's completely mined away. But there was an intrusion, a quartz monzonite, a mixed zone, but then there's metamorphism of the surrounding limestone to create characteristic mineral zones. Garnet zones, garnet was stable. Idacrase, idacrase is a calcilicate. Monticellite, monticellite is another calcilicate. And many, many contact orioles have this distribution of mineral zones around them. The Ubihibi contact oriole is one that I have visited. This is in Death Valley National Park. This is Ubihibi Peak. It's a big intrusion and it intrudes into these siliceous limestones. So there's a contact oriole that extends from the edge of the intrusion outward into these siliceous limestones. And some of these rocks are completely incredible. This is one of these limestones, and what you're seeing are these long, skinny lines. These are worm burrows, so called scolithos. So these are primary sedimentary features. This rock has been completely undeformed and retains these trace fossils. But down here, you see these kind of cauliflower-shaped blobs. These are tremolite. These are big rosettes of tremolite. They're more or less spherical. These are metamorphic. So in other words, the heat from the intrusion plus water plus some silica came in, caused this siliceous limestone to react to form tremolite. This is a geologic map of the region. So this is the Ubihibi Peak Pluton down here. And these are different sedimentary units that abut the intrusion. And we see that there are different mineral isograds here. Tremolite in means that tremolite is present in this region, but it is not present in this region. Forsterite in, forsterite is magnesium and member olivine. Forsterite is present in this region but it's not present in this region. And periclase in means periclase is present in these areas, but not in these areas. And that's what an isograd is. It's the first appearance in the field of a distinctive mineral. So we would call this the tremolite in isograd, the forsterite in isograd, the periclase in isograd, because this is where these minerals first appear in the field. Okay, this is a little tricky. What kinds of minerals would you expect to form in contact orioles? And the answer is low density minerals. Contact orioles typically have a large temperature gradient. Large temperature gradients form where hot rocks intrude cold rocks. Cold rocks tend to occur closer to the surface, so they're going to form at low pressure. High pressure stabilizes high density minerals. So stishovite is stable only deep in the mantle. These minerals, especially umphacite, forms only at high pressure. Moderate density minerals at moderate pressure. And so it's really the low density minerals that we would expect to form in contact orioles. Let's switch now and talk about Barrow's zones. Barrow's zones refer to the characteristic minerals that we observe in metamorphosed mudstones. 
Barrow first mapped this area in Scotland, what he found is that there are distinct zones here. There's a chloride zone, biotite zone, garnet zone, and so on. And they are expressed in a gradient across this area. Here, this is the same map, just colored. So this green region is chlorite. The sort of orange region is biotite. Red is garnet. Purple is kyanite, so on. So what does that mean? In the chloride zone, the characteristic metamorphic mineral is chlorite. In the biotite zone, so this line right through here would be the biotite isograd. In the biotite zone, biotite is the characteristic metamorphic mineral. This would then be the garnet isograd. And so in this region, garnet is the characteristic metamorphic mineral, and so on and so on. It's important that some of these lower grade minerals can persist to higher grade. So garnet zone rocks could easily contain biotite and chlorite. Although it is true that as you go to higher and higher and higher grade, kyanite and sillimanite, the likelihood that you will find chlorite is much lower. In 2013, I had an opportunity to go visit Barrow's zones in the region where Barrow was actually mapping. And I was really rather surprised at what I saw because mostly what it is is pasture. There's very little outcrop here. There is some along the riverbanks and there are some exposures up here in the hills. But the fact that Barrow was able to map out these zones with such little exposure is really a testament to his qualities as a scientist. Barrow zones can be mapped out in many other origins. This is New England, so here's Massachusetts, northeastern United States. The hotter colors here are higher temperature metamorphic minerals, sillimanite, K. feldspar. The cooler colors over here are lower grade metamorphic zones, bitite and chlorite. And you can see these gradients that go from lower grade rocks up to higher grade rocks, just like we saw in Scotland with Barrow zones. What do these minerals look like? The lowest grade index minerals are chlorite, coexisting with muscovite. So here's chlorite, green, flaky, sheet silicate with some silvery muscovite. The biotite zone, here's some nice brown biotite flakes. Garnet, red, soccer ball shaped crystals. Storolite that has this characteristic cross section and long blocky crystals and some twins here. The three aluminous silicates. Kyanite, which is blue and kind of bladed. Sillimanite, which has these little skinny needles. Andalusite. Andalusite forms these characteristic prisms. Oftentimes you can find chiastolite crosses in their cross sections. And then K feldspar, this is a high temperature nice, and there's potassium feldspar present in this rock. When we look at the distribution of Barrow zones minerals on a pressure temperature diagram, they distribute themselves approximately like this. Low temperature is biotite. So this is the chlorite zone down here. At 450 degrees or so, biotite will form. And so these rocks up here will have biotite in them. At typically 475, 500 degrees, garnet will form. And so as we are at higher temperatures, garnet will be stable. And as we increase temperature, then we will see these other minerals form. Storolite at higher temperature, kyanite. If we transition into the sillimanite zone, sillimanite will become stable. K feldspar. And at very high temperatures, we can see orthopyroxene forming. OK, question here. What series of aluminous silicates would you expect to see in a Barovian sequence? So if you're walking in the field and you transition from this PT condition to this PT condition, what series of aluminous silicates would you see? And of course, you need to know what the stability fields are for the aluminous silicates. Once I put these in, kyanite, sillimanite, and andalusite, you can see that the Barovian sequence transitions from the kyanite stability field to the sillimanite stability field. Andalusite to sillimanite. Andalusite is a low density, low pressure mineral. So it forms only in low pressure environments like contact metamorphic systems. And kyanite only is characteristic of subduction zones, which are high pressure and relatively low temperature.
So at this point, I hope students will be able to say something about mineral assemblages and how they re reflect conditions of metamorphism, and then have a sense of what typical metamorphic rocks and minerals look like. Now I'd like to turn very briefly to discuss characteristics of aluminous silicates. There are three aluminous silicates, as I mentioned before, andalusite, sillimanite, and kyanite. And there's really only a couple of things that are important here. First is the physical characteristics of these crystals. Andalusite tends to form blocky crystals, and it forms these really distinctive chiastolite crosses. Sillimanite forms these fine needles. It's often intergrown with biotite. Kyanite forms these bladed crystals, and it is commonly blue in hand sample. Now, andalusite and sillimanite are very similar structurally. They have these chain structures. Here's a chain running through sillimanite. Here's a chain running through andalusite. And it turns out it's very easy to convert sillimanite to andalusite. All you really need to do is kink the structure. And what that means is that you can commonly see andalusite forming after sillimanite, like on top of sillimanite. Or you can find sillimanite that is an old andalusite crystal that's just inverted to sillimanite. It can still preserve some of its texture from when it was andalusite. Kyanite is totally different. Kyanite has a very slabby structure. It doesn't have the same kind of chain structure. As a consequence, you very rarely see kyanite growing on sillimanite, kyanite growing on andalusite, andalusite growing on kyanite, or sillimanite growing on kyanite. Usually, these aluminous silicates are separated in a rock. So you might find kyanite in one area, sillimanite in another area, but they're not actually touching each other and in close association. Very different from andalusite and sillimanite. Storolite has kyanite slabs running through the middle of it that are connected with these intervening layers of aluminum, iron, magnesium, oxyhydroxide. So a kyanite slab, oxyhydroxide layer, kyanite slab, oxyhydroxide layer, and so on. What that means is that kyanite and storolite can be found growing together in close association. Again, different from andalusite, different from sillimanite. They also happen to have rather similar optical characteristics, very similar relief. Both have low interference colors. Of course, storolite is yellow in thin section, usually. Kyanite normally doesn't have any color in thin section.